Ever wonder what the real reason is behind your favorite classic stars of the silver and small screens? Real Stars Weekly's got you covered. Sofia Coppola, famed filmmaker, classic sexy star of the Godfather series, and, as will be revealed in this episode of Real Stars Weekly, the top secret star-crossed lover of TV's Andy Garcia. Ready? Here we go. In the heady latter half of the 1980s, 15 years after the second Godfather movie blessed the silver screen with its cinema magic, Sofia Coppola's daddy, and chief creative force behind the Godfather series, Francis Ford Coppola, was running hot. Every film he directed in the late 1980s was a stone-cold classic and box office success, by even Francis Ford Coppola's own, exacting standards. But his self-acknowledged commercial and critical success felt hollow. One fateful Sunday morning, while dining at the Great Hollywood Brunch restaurant with his daughter Sofia Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola looked up into the sunny, Hollywood sky, with damp, pleading eyes, and, melodramatically spreading his arms and raising them aloft, appealed to the heavens thusly. Why is it, oh lord? What could the reason possibly be? How could I come into such great and unquestionable success in the late 1980s specifically, and still feel no joy? Could it perhaps be because my beautiful, sexy daughter, Sofia Coppola, isn't getting the recognition she feels she deserves for all of the innovative acting she is doing in countless school plays and community theater productions? Yes, replied the revered filmmaker to himself, sweating and nodding desperately, this is why I feel so unfulfilled, this is why my otherwise creatively expansive and, technically, Academy Award eligible late 1980s output feels like a long, mediocre spittle thread of commercial and critical shrugs. It is because you, my daughter, Sofia Coppola, feel so unfulfilled in your own creative endeavors. Sofia Coppola's eyes flashed as she listened hungrily to her daddy's every word from across the great Hollywood brunch table full of untouched brunch spaghetti and signature Francis Ford Coppola mimosas. If she understood her daddy's sweaty, nervous preamble correctly, and if past experience was any indicator, it meant that daddy would be buying her a brand new golf cart to replace the one that her friends the goats ate. Francis Ford Coppola continued his manic diatribe, now drenched in tears, happy ones, not sad ones. If you're unfulfilled, then I'm unfulfilled, no matter how wonderful my 1980s output has obviously been. And then, daughter listened in astonishment as daddy solemnly proclaimed, without a hint of irony, that the only way for daughter's artistic talents to reach a broader, more open-minded audience was for daddy to resurrect the Godfather franchise and have daughter star in it, as famed movie mobster Michael Corle won daughter, Mary. Sofia Coppola's ravenous, golf cart expectant gaze hardened into a cold inscrutability. But her mind was spinning at a thousand frames a second, like a film projector at a classic movie marathon that started 18 hours too late and only had 3 hours to screen 20 feature-length films before the end of the theater rental period. She wanted to tell Daddy that although she knew in her bones that she had something new and intoxicating to offer the world with her interesting acting, she was also self-aware enough to know that she had only been acting for two months, and was not yet ready for such a gargantuan cultural and artistic undertaking. She wanted to tell Daddy that the Godfather series wasn't really the kind of story begging for a third installment. She wanted to tell Daddy that a new golf cart was really all the creative fulfillment she needed in life. But the words would not come. She knew that if she shared any one of these thoughts it would break her poor daddy's weak, babyish heart. And so Sofia Coppola said nothing. It was all she could do just to nod in assent as her daddy laughed heartily, a terrible mixture of happy tears and flop sweat streaming down his face. He told her that she would do great, because it was literally their only option. Then, ominously, his laughter ceased with the troubling immediacy and his smiling face melted into a dead-eyed blankness, like a suddenly switch-off android. And the so-called happy tears still streaming down his death mask of a face fooled none of the occupants of the great Hollywood brunch restaurant, each and every one of whom had an eagerly following Francis Ford Coppola's faded monologue with bated breath. Pre-production began on The Godfather Part 3 without delay. Francis Ford Coppola wrote the first and final draft of the screenplay with his best friend, Mario, over a single fun weekend in Mario's mom's basement. To this day, the amount of pizza, soda pop, and gossip consumed that weekend is the stuff of legend. Rehearsals were held the following Monday at the Palazzo del Coppola, 
Francis Ford Coppola's sprawling 520-acre seaside compound in scenic North Hollywood, located right next door to Circus Liquor, where in just five short years, a scene from Clueless would be filmed that would change Hollywood forever. But back at the Palazzo, the legacy cast members of the Godfather series, including acting legend and all-around good guy, Al Pacino, gathered around a nervous Sofia Coppola on her first day of the job and, surrounding her from all sides, slowly closed ranks around her like a boa constrictor. This is it, thought Sofia Coppola in terror. Already they have sniffed me out as an amateur, an imposter, an arrogant, nepotistic dilettante, and now they are closing in to devour me, to drink up all of my bad creativity and absorb it into their own bottomless well of good creativity, so that they can expel the whole concoction over my crumpled, lifeless body in the form of really good acting. Just to show me how easy it all comes to them. How they can make anything work. So be it. I'm a fake and I deserve to die. I deserve it. Whether it was because Sofia Coppola involuntarily screamed these last three thoughts out loud and clearly needed some affection, or because this was the plan all along, the legacy cast members of The Godfather enveloped Sofia Coppola in a circle of love and hugged her and kissed her like nobody's business. Welcoming her into their little troop the only way they knew how, through kindness and understanding. From then on, Sofia Coppola felt just like one of the guys, a made man. As for her acting, it turned out that all of her hand-wringing and self-doubt was for nothing. Sofia Coppola's performance as Mary Corleone was, according to one Hollywood insider, literally breathtaking. In fact, her scenes with her character's cousin and love interest, Vincent Corleone, who was portrayed in rehearsals by her real-life cousin, Barry Coppola, were so real and so sexy that if flushed and panting Diane Keaton had to take frequent bathroom breaks whenever a love scene began between the classic, lustful cousins. But as we all know, they were only acting, and in real life, Sophia loved Barry only as a cousin is meant to love a cousin, as blood is meant to love blood. Besides, Barry was far too ugly to play the sexy, virile cousin Vincent Corle one, and Francis Ford Coppola was also acutely aware of the pummeling he'd take in the press if he made two of his barely legal blood relations passionately make out with one another on camera. That's when Francis Ford Coppola first met Andy Garcia, a gas station parking attendant with black, reptilian eyes, Neanderthal frame, and a thick, sinewy layer of sun-kissed, olive skin. Andy Garcia stood vacantly next to a gas pump, focusing his limited capacities on blinking and breathing, as Francis Ford Coppola jumped out from his personal stretch limousine and, hopping from one foot to the other, pointed melodramatically at Andy Garcia with both hands. Hallelujah! Here he is, oh lord! Here he is! In the flesh! My Vincent Corle one! Boomed Francis Ford Coppola triumphantly causing the skittish and half-feral Andy Garcia to take shelter underneath Francis Ford Coppola's stretch limousine. After coaxing a trembling, oil-soaked Andy Garcia out from beneath the limousine with soothing whispers and a can of fresh tuna, Francis Ford Coppola explained to Andy Garcia what movies were, and asked if he wanted to be in one. Once the question was put simply enough for him to understand, Andy Garcia agreed to star in Francis Ford Coppola's movie, nodding his head profusely like a tuxedoed ape in a circus act. By casting this acting newcomer, with his beefcake physique and raw, animal sexuality, Francis Ford Coppola thought he had found the final piece to his Godfather Part 3 puzzle. But as it would turn out, this puzzle piece was irregularly shaped, and by forcing it into place, Francis Ford Coppola would warp irrevocably all the surrounding pieces, including his most treasured puzzle piece of all, his beloved daughter, Sofia Coppola. When they first met in Sofia Coppola's luxurious gold-plated production trailer on the first day of principal photography, Andy Garcia and Sofia Coppola couldn't stand one another at all. Andy Garcia called her a stuck-up, rich girl snobby type lady who don't know nothing about real living, and Sofia Coppola slapped Andy Garcia silly for breaking her community theater acting award with his clumsy, apish hands. But once they were prepped, in costume, and on their way to The Godfather Part 3 set, which was located 200 kilometers below the Earth's crust to simulate the proper atmospheric density of 1970s New York, all their animosity dissolved away like so much pasta in stomach acid. While descending into the cool, musty depths of the Earth's crust, a power outage caused Sofia Coppola and Andy Garcia's elevator to stop 100 kilometers between the film's set and the surface of the Earth. 
It is still a classic Hollywood mystery what went on in that elevator in the 20 minutes it took for rescue workers to climb up the elevator shaft, but once the elevator doors were pried open, Sofia Coppola and Andy Garcia were found locked in a beautiful lover's embrace, lip kissing like nobody's business. Rescue workers were shocked, but sworn to secrecy, signing the strongest NDAs available at the time which Sophia drew up with her lawyer, Barry Coppola, who had coincidentally taken the elevator down with the two new lovers. The crux of the agreement? Francis Ford Coppola must not find out about this new love. Daddy had always warned Sophia Coppola that falling in love with a co-star in real life could ruin the atmosphere and efficiency of a film set and that if he ever caught her doing it he would never forgive her. Once they arrived on set, exactly five minutes apart, the now shy and reserved Sofia Coppola and the now chaste and demure Andy Garcia couldn't stop glancing over at one another and then quickly looking away with fluttering lashes and bashful smiles. Seeing his romantic lead so eagerly and passionately in character, an overzealous Francis Ford Coppola cried action mere seconds after his own loud and disruptive arrival on set. Sofia Coppola and Andy Garcia lunged into their scene together with such intensity and sexiness that Diane Keaton fell into a rapturous stupor on the couch, breathing the names of her former lovers into the cushions, until finally losing consciousness. And this, in only the first 30 seconds, before the big kiss even. The scene was a smash hit, and everyone there knew it. Francis Ford Coppola's face presented a neutral mask of professional inscrutability, but in his brain, he was speechless with delight. When he was finally able to whisper cut, the shocking truth was too much for the big little guy to bear. The lens cap was still on the camera, and the cameraman had not yet arrived to operate the camera. In fact, no one was on set at the time but Andy Garcia, Sofia Coppola, and the ravished-looking Diane Keaton, who was fanning herself with her script pages, which she clutched with a fevered intensity. Francis Ford Coppola rushed off the set in tears, imploring the heavens as to why the world could be so cruel to him and him alone. As she watched her father storm off set, Sofia Coppola's heart sunk. Daddy knows, she thought. Our scene had been too sexy. Too believable. Could it be that in our burning on-screen chemistry? Daddy could somehow see the truth of our real-life relationship? Or even piece together the nature and sordid details of our illegal tryst on the subterranean elevator this morning? Oh, perished the thought. Sofia Coppola turned desperately to Andy Garcia, who was busy looking at the wallpaper. My darling Andy, ever since our first kiss in that cold and dreary elevator 38 minutes ago, I've loved you so. And I can tell by the day's look in your eyes that you love me too. Nothing can change what we feel for one another. But we must be careful. Daddy would never approve of a relationship between two co-stars outside the bounds of fiction. To protect our frothing love from his whining vengeance, we must throw him off the scent. The flaming passions of a thousand suns that we experienced in the elevator this morning can never again show itself in our scenes together. Daddy must never again see the truth of our love in the eyes of our characters Mary and Vincent Coral One. However much it may pain us as professional actors who intentionally deliver a bad performance, our scenes together must be wooden, stilted. Like the pubescently fumbling, dead-eyed romantic leads I used to see in the musicals my high school would put on before Daddy let me overhaul the school's entire arts program. Recognizing the words high school and remembering all the fun times he had back then, Andy Garcia nodded and smiled sadly. Sofia Coppola took this to mean he understood. And so it was. Their love was to be a secret love, and their scenes together would lack any traceable amount of sexual chemistry to help sell the lie. During breaks in filming, Sofia Coppola and Andy Garcia would scamper off into a secret underground cave that they had found. Hours later, when called back onto set, they would then be spotted leaving the very same underground cave together, hand in paw, the tips of their noses rub red and raw from so many Eskimo kisses, and the telltale love bites littering their necks, earlobes, and eyelids, forget about it. But once their love wounds were secretly and heavily make -upped, and the golden lights and the purring cameras of Hollywood were trained on their beautiful faces, Sofia Coppola would stifle any discernible charisma. But Andy Garcia, misreading their earlier solemn vow as a spontaneous remembrance of high school glories past, continued to act reasonably well. But it didn't matter. Sofia Coppola's intentionally empty performance was bad enough to extinguish any sexy vibes between them, causing a poor Diane Keaton to yawn derisively. 
Francis Ford Coppola would leave the set sobbing more and more after each take, causing Sofia Coppola to make her acting even worse, interpreting her daddy's sobbing as a reaction to some glimmer in her eye that could somehow be traced back to her actual love for Andy Garcia, the sexiest brute in showbiz. So focused was Sofia Coppola on selling the lie that it even affected her scenes with other actors. Al Pacino, in a doomed attempt to overcompensate for Sofia Coppola's stilted depiction of Nancy Corleone, delivered an especially overwrought and melodramatic performance, one of the worst of his career. As it would turn out, his good creativity was no match for Sofia Coppola's bad creativity. By the time principal photography had staggered to a finish, Sofia Coppola's contagiously bad performance as Nancy Corleone had brought the entire cast and crew down to her level. Francis Ford Coppola lost hundreds of pounds. He was a hollow shell of his former self, trapped in a deep, depressive haze. In his own arrogance and hubris, he had destroyed his only living daughter's acting career before it could even begin. And what's worse, his own winning streak as a filmmaker was over. Sofia Coppola and Andy Garcia's secret, whiz-bang romance fizzled without fanfare, five days after production ended. After saying their final goodbyes at the Great Hollywood Brunch restaurant, Sofia Coppola watched with a melancholic dread as Andy Garcia wandered away stupidly onto a nearby film set, where director Kenneth Branagh immediately cast him in a scene he was shooting. Sofia Coppola sighed continuously for three minutes. Clearly, Andy Garcia's acting career is just beginning, said Sofia Coppola to her reflection in a spoon. But what about me? What of my so-called star-crossed love? What of my acting dreams? Did I consciously destroy my father's film and my own acting career for nothing? And she began to cry, bitterly beating her breast and wringing her hands like a silent movie starlet, right there at the center table of the crowded Hollywood brunch restaurant. When she was finally able to pull herself together, she closed her eyes, bracing herself for the shocked and horrified stares of the restaurant's occupants. But then she heard something that she never thought she'd hear again. Applause. She opened her eyes and looked up in disbelief. A thousand and one tearful smiles on a thousand and one jaded Hollywood insider faces as far as the eye could see, their booming applause enveloped her like the warm hug from the legacy cast members of the Godfather series. Trying to stifle a smile, she stood up from her seat and bowed, deeply and seriously. Hysterically blubbering in public on that cold winter's eve remains her finest performance to date. Her only regret was that her father was not there to see this, and that he never bought her a new golf cart. Want to hear more real stories of your favorite classic stars? Subscribe to Real Stars Weekly, and let us know what classic stars you want to hear the real truth about.